Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Bash Mania podcast. This is episode 195. And today, Tyler Berger joins the podcast. He was originally slated to come on just after the U.S. Open. My wife ended up giving birth to our little baby girl, Mila. And I took a couple of weeks off of podcasting. So we're just getting around to this now. But it's good. He's had some time to digest and really think about the Open, his training leading up to the Open. So I'm excited to dive into today's conversation with Tyler. First, this podcast is brought to you by our friends at Attack, A-T-A-C, Attack. Video game stats meets real-life training. What's your attack rating? Put in the work to get closer to your goals. Attack is a training app for wrestlers, for anybody really who wants to get in shape, but it's made by wrestlers with wrestlers in mind. Wrestlers are at the forefront of their vision when they design this app, when they improve this app and do all the things that they're doing to it. It's amazing. And now with all these cool video game like stats they have where your strength, endurance, mental agility, flexibility, all sorts of cool stuff gives you an overall attack rating. If you follow attack on social ATAC.app, you can see all the different wrestlers sharing their attack ratings. Super, super cool to see where you stack up against some of the best across the country and see really wrestlers on all different levels and see where you stack up. So super cool. Download the attack app and level up today. ATAC attack available in the Apple app store and Google play store today. We are back with what I would argue and say is the U S open MOW. I think that's who bash mania would give it to Tyler Berger, also known as pup, which I don't know. Can you explain that one as we get started? (laughs) Yeah, that one's following me around still. So that that was given to me when I first got to Nebraska by Brian Snyder. And it came because we were we were always competitive in the room and I was, you know, a firecracker right away and I wanted to scrap. And so every now and then I could get some takedowns on the best guys. And when I'd go with Snyder, I'd get some takedowns and stuff. But then there would be days where he would still just put it on me. And he would always just end <laughs> with still just a pup, just a pup. And it made me so mad. It, it would like legitimately make me mad. And I was like, dude, don't call me that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, from then on, it was like, as soon as I showed any emotion towards it, it was like, oh, then it sticks. Like there, yeah. there's, there's nothing worse than like being in a wrestling room and telling somebody don't do something because yeah. they're going to do it. It doesn't okay. matter. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's done. Every time I go to find you on Twitter, I have like a temporary brain fart. Forget what your your handle is. And I can't type in your name. And I'm like, oh, no, it's not his name. It's Pop. Uh, um, which- I haven't been on Twitter, honestly, in so long. I forget. <laughs> My la- The last I just went on it. And the last tweet you had was my tweet from 2021 announcing you're headed out to California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I'm not on Twitter. I, I've, like, put it away. Yeah, yeah, you got some updating to do when you get back into Twitter. So, yeah. all right, let, let's have some fun. Let's talk about this. This past year alone, you've had a crazy year. There's so many great storylines and in, in wrestlers in this sport. And with this podcast, timing, I think, is important on when I have people on. And as soon, and everybody's always telling me from the Burroughs clan to Willie, you got to have Burger on. You got to have Mama. Uh, I know, like at the right time. And then you just smash through this open. And Willie's like, I'm sending the text right now. You got to have him on. I'm like, I'm in. Then, then we have a baby. So things got delayed a little bit. But the U.S. Open... You had a heck of a tournament. You had Tech, 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 I believe, and then an 11 10 win over Hydley and a 10 9 thriller over Sammy Sasso. I guess talk to me first about heading into the tournament, what you were thinking. Because even as a fan, like 70 kilos was one of those weights that you thought was like what could happen here. And then right away, like you have Pantelio getting pinned in the first round, and it's like, this is wrestling. This is wrestling 101. Yeah. So, I mean, going to the tournament, it was, it was all geared towards Pentelio. It was yeah. everything that I can do to prepare for Alec. And I mean, he was so clearly the guy to be that, I mean, <clears throat> there's other guys in the weight, but um, I, I just figured Pentelio is going to be the guy that that's in the finals. Right. If I'm yeah. going to make, I'm going to win the U S open. I'm going to have to beat him at some point in the tournament. And so that's really all I was thinking about. And, this was the first round 
of I'm I'm about to I'm warming up on a mat three mats down from where Pentelia was wrestling. And I look up and he's on his back. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and once he gets pinned, I turned to Coach Slay and I was like, Pentelia just got pinned. And then I look back and I'm up on the mat. Like <laughs> there was a quick tech in front of me. And he's yeah. like, hey, you've got to focus, like go wrestle. And so I wrestle and I get off the mat and it was just kind of like, slay and even jordan had come up to me like did you see it and it was like hey we got to focus on today and obviously hidley was a big threat um so there was still yeah. the i still had to be focused and get to the finals and it was just like it was crazy i mean everything that i had been thinking about as far as preparing for pentelia was out the window now because now it was right. like we're, we're full steam ahead and whoever comes out on that side then let's get ready to rock tomorrow night yeah, it's crazy, too, because we'll talk about Zane in a little bit, but I'm sure like I've had wrestlers tell me that they almost don't like when that happens because they don't want they know there's going to be the critics. Oh, well, if so and so didn't get pinned earlier. Well, this didn't happen. It, it's like, first of all, that's outside of your control. But you get a lot of these people that say all these things, and I feel like it builds the chip even stronger. It's just like with um with what happened with Spencer going down at NCAAs. Like, Pat Glory wanted Spencer in the finals. Doesn't take away from him winning, but you know he wants it. So I'm imagining for you, that's got to just ignite it further with the match heading up for Zane. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I also, yeah, it's like I wanted Pentelio. There's that matchup. I've only beat the guy one time. He's beat me like 15,000 times. So <laughs> I, I want to be able to beat that guy, but also – it's not that bad to not have to wrestle Pentelio at the US Open. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, there's still that. Like, I'm not going to be like, I'm so angry that I didn't have to wrestle Pentelio. Like, hey, man, that stuff happens and you got to wrestle the guy in front of you. Yeah. And speaking of wrestling the guy, guys in front of you, you know, the Hydley match was a thriller. And then the Sammy Sasso match, you know, it's funny. I, I did at the PRTC RTC card. I did interviews after the matches and I'll probably never do it again. I did it because I can't say no to the PRTC guys. They asked me, I said, I'm there, but it's very hard, but I do like watching them and getting some substance for the show. Like once you've had time to get your emotions, adrenaline, everything back in order. And then let's revisit that. And like that seven second drill that you mentioned, like we do that all the time. Who would have thought that's how you're going to win a U.S. open championship. How long did that take to settle in? Like, holy crap, we actually won because of, uh, you know, obviously the whole weekend, a lot of wrestling, but like that final moment came down to literally something specific. You drill. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so unreal. I mean, there, the moment, like I, I've, I've told people, like, I can't even remember the feeling, any sensation around me of like even celebrating I don't even remember being in that moment, but I've watched it and it's like, I'm watching somebody else do, <laughs> do that, you know? And it's yeah. so crazy. And, you know, obviously everything's geared towards Zane right now and making the world team. And, you know, I don't know. I think if I make this world team and I, I continue to press on of, of being the, a world champ, it, it could reflect all the way back to the U S open of, well, he had seven seconds of not being there, you know? And it's just yeah. kind of like, man, it's a real blessing. And, yeah, crazy how God was working in that moment of the whole training camp, training for that moment, and then it comes up, and then having seen success in that moment when, like, all odds say that you're not getting that takedown. Because I didn't need just a push-out either. That's another right. thing. The, he he could have just ran out of bounds, and he would have yeah. been fine. Uh, the fact that I needed a two-point and got it was – just unreal. Still doesn't seem real. <laughs> it's funny too, because like from a, from a marketing and branding standpoint, which I always seem to like have that hat on as I'm looking things as soon as you want, I'm like, okay, there's the reaction of the weekend. And I'm like texting Rotundo, like, please tell me you got every angle possible of that. Cause it was amazing. And you could see the raw motion. And I'm cur curious for you. Like, like you just said, things now you can kind of trace back to it. I'm imagining when that happens, the confidence level, very much like Gable winning the Olympics, like something like that happens at the very end. And it's like, dang, you can do that. That's not just something cliche to drill. That's not just something to improve conditioning. It's something very practical. How does that now change your confidence levels moving forward? 
Yeah, I mean, I think just – so, yeah, with that match, I don't look on that match really and see a lot of wins. Um, like, I think that was a tough match for me where I go back and I watch the film and it's a lot of not-so-great things. And then there's this this one moment that is like, hey, listen, even when things aren't going your way, maybe you're not feeling the best throughout the match and still being able to dig down deep and – rely on the things that we trained on all these like tough moments that I'm putting myself through where, you know, necessarily, I, I don't know if they're paying off or not, but I'm hoping they are. And you're putting in these investments and then all of a sudden they pay off and you're like, all right, you know, right. It, yep. it's good. And so, and there was a tough moment just recently this last week uh, of training and Slay was just telling me like, Hey, these are moments you got to push through. And I just remember like, it was one of those moments of being angry with your coach for how tired you are. And <laughs> yeah. I just, I remember I was laying on my back and I was like, I trust you. And, and you know, it goes back all the way to, you know, us open. It's like, we're doing these things. And I'm questioning it. Like, why are we doing it? But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm putting my faith in, in my training partners and my coaches. And then knowing that I can dig down and go get it is big. Slay's a very humble, great guy, so he wouldn't do this. But what a I told you so moment for him. <laughs> like, oh, when I know. You, when I you know. have everybody <laughs> drilling something and then it happens, it's awesome. Oh, um, yeah. And you've always had great confidence. I remember, you know, Jason Nolf has been a good friend of mine for a long time. And when you tweeted out, like, I'm coming for Nolf's head or whatever you tweeted out, I think it was your senior year. I remember talking to Nolf about it. And he's like, good. He should be confident. Like, he wants to win this, too. He wants it. And... You know, confidence is a funny thing because with wrestling, there's so many takeaways and it's such a roller coaster. You win some, you lose some, you, you went like you just even said with, with the Sammy Sasso match, it's like you had a great outcome, but there were a lot of things you're unhappy with. There's a lot of highs and lows in the sport and you've, you've had, you know, NCAA finals, you lose to Nolf here, this open, you win like a lot of highs and lows to contrast. And I know for you how important your faith is. How much has your faith helped you navigate all these highs and lows and, you know, having confidence and managing expectations and kind of constantly having to like reset and not affiliate with just one outcome, good or bad? Yeah, I mean, I've had a roller coaster uh, just with my faith in general and with wrestling, like this relationship of faith and wrestling and trying to figure out how do I navigate it? And, you know, it goes from back in college where almost thinking that my faith could make me soft and weak to then like, okay, all I'm putting all my baskets or all, all my eggs in one basket as far as faith goes. And then like just hope things work out in wrestling when really I'm not being fully responsible and, you know, obedient in that way of, of the gifts that God's given me. And, you know, then and then all of a sudden now I'm like, I feel like I'm finally maturing to a point where I'm getting to the where I, I can see it as God's blessing of, you know, I'm not hurt and he, he's given me uh, a desire and a passion and a warrior mentality that I'm going to use and I'm going to be obedient to, okay, he's given me the energy to wake up today and be disciplined and have the self-control and go and spend that energy that he's given me. And I, I'm, I'm, it's more of this open hand of, okay, the results I'm going to leave up to the Lord. And that, that would, that was, that was the coolest thing for me at the open where it's like, I did really feel like I was in the best place spiritually going into that tournament where I didn't know what was going to happen. And I wasn't, I wasn't telling myself you're going to be the U S open champ, no matter what, like I understood things can get crazy. You could go out there and you could get thrown to your back and pin first round. Like that happens. Yep. And, uh, but just understanding that if anything crazy were to happen, that this is a way that God's going to teach you something you don't want it to happen, obviously, and I'm praying for victory. But uh, either way, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna look to to the to the Lord to to teach me something in that moment. And yeah, in the in the heroic fashion that it happened, where I'm I won. I I literally isolated myself after I won, put my hood up, and I just sat down, and I was just like, oh my gosh, like Lord, how, this was crazy. I didn't expect it to be like this. Um, yep. Just like so thankful. Yeah, and one. One verse you shared right after one thing that I've gotten to habit. Shout out Dave Tommaso. I think he's the greatest pastor, one of the greatest humans I know. He he when I got saved years ago, one thing that he always encouraged was read a proverb every single day to kind of start your devotions, to start your reading. There's 31 proverbs you can read one every day. So on the 21st of every month, 
I hear right here. I read the verse um, 31. Get the horse ready for battle and victory belongs to the Lord. So I'm very familiar with that. Reading that at least 12 times a year, every single month. What does that verse mean to you in particular? You know, you mentioned it. It's always funny, like interviews after, right after the matches can be tough because you haven't even caught your breath yet. You haven't even focused. The adrenaline's rushing. And a lot of times, like wrestlers are getting better. I remember talking to David Carr about this. You know, like he knew going into NCAAs, win or lose, Aaron Brooks, same thing. Like, I want to use my platform to glory God. And, and you kind of know some things. But when you have that level of adrenaline you had, you can tell it wasn't something you really like prepared to <clears throat> prepare to say. It just came out. It's what was in your heart. Talk to me about what that verse means to you. Yeah. So, and, th and this is kind of, so going into this whole year, I went to several overseas tournaments and fly all the way to Croatia, go one and one losing in a fashion that I'm not used to losing it and having a lead blow it at the end. Can't muster enough energy to go get another point, lose a match to a guy that I, I thought I was better than few, five weeks later, fly to uh, Egypt and I go, Oh, and one had a crazy match where I'm winning and I give up the lead with eight seconds left, lose the match. I, I wrestle six minutes and I'm just like super frustrated with how everything's going. I'm, I'm really disciplined. My weight cuts great. I feel like I'm doing a lot of extra work going to these practices, killing myself, coming back, recovering hard, going to sleep early, sacrificing with food and, you know, time I could be spending with my wife and all these different things. And I just don't see these things paying out. And this training camp getting ready for the U S open. I just felt like it was a sense of God kind of stripping away my pride and my selfishness. And so, yeah, when I ran across that verse, it was like, I feel like this is my verse for this whole training camp. So I just kept reading it and reading it and meditating on it. And, you know, I do do the things that I can control. Like I go to sleep on time. I'm eating great. I'm recovering well, sauna, cold pool outside, like all these, like, you know, people make fun of me for the stuff that I'm doing. And it seems like, dude, you don't have to be doing all those things all the time. And to me, I'm like, I'm, I'm giving myself the best chance I can possibly have to go out yeah. there and with the realization that, Hey, you could go out there, you get laced up and your dreams over and right. Hey, better luck next year at the Olympic trials kind of deal. And it's like, man, this is a huge moment and I can either hold on to it so tightly and just try to force my way into it. And, you know, a lot of the times I've, I've done that in the past with college of like, I need to win a national title and thinking like those things are going to, I'm going to make it in some way. And those are going to satisfy me. And having that verse just kind of was like, okay, whatever happens, the Lord's good either way. And ultimately I'm, I, I know I'm not created to just win wrestling matches. And so my, my goal is to always make the Lord known and know him more. And so that doesn't really line up with wins in a wrestling match. And like, I right. hope it, hope I win and I'm going to prepare to win. And I think the platform that he's given me has been able to reach more people because of it, but wins on a wrestling mat aren't, aren't what I'm most worried about. So it, that was like the coolest thing I had full training camp to kind of really settle into that and then um you know saw fruit from it yeah you know it's almost like somebody i know hopefully probably listening started a podcast called greater gold that hopefully we get some episodes going again um so it's funny because the juxtaposition of even in the short term when a thing i reference all the time is that god often sends his denials for our request for silver wrapped in gold and it's like some things like going all the way to Egypt to wrestle six minutes, lose and come home. Maybe without that, you don't win the open, but you're not thinking on the flight home from Egypt. Oh, it's all good. I'm winning the open in a couple months. So like, this was just the setup. Like it's crazy how just having that faith and trust can kind of in the future, it's, like you said, it's, it's not always about wins and losses, but in, in life and business and whatever, you're going to have those aspects of defeat and failure and loss and then you take them a little bit more in stride when you've gone through things where like well yeah but that one time i took a lot took a big loss in egypt then when they open so it's pretty pretty cool to see that prtc i think it was about a year ago now you headed out there and the 
the jumps you've made, you know, just winning the U.S. Open now, you're more active on the senior level. How has this move helped you, in your opinion? I mean, it's it's given me opportunities that I don't think I would have in, in other places. I've been able to travel overseas three times. Uh, I've never wrestled in an international tournament before I moved to the PRTC. And right away, me and Joey McKenna were training for a tournament in Kazakhstan, all getting prepared by Joey. Joey's the one that reached out to these coaches who knew coaches who set up this whole trip and nobody was like doing it for him where no, no coach was doing it for him. USA wrestling wasn't doing it for him. It was Joey making these connections and just having guys like that in the room where they're really active in their progression to be a world champ. It's huge because I, I didn't know, I don't know a lot of these things. Like I haven't been on the senior level doing well, you know? And so I just kind of show up in the wrestling room and train But these guys are active. They've been on the senior level for a while. They've had success. They know that they have the connections and they're in the room working hard every day. And then we have a coach who isn't affiliated with any college. So his main focus is getting us better. And he is an Olympic gold medalist. He's been at the highest level. And so just the trust that I have in him is tremendous. And, you know, then it's just a, it's a cool team thing that I haven't had since college. And it just feels different on the senior level where we're not training to win national titles. We're training to be a world champ, Olympic champs. And uh, it just, yeah. Like I don't want to be left behind. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a reason I had specifically said like more active on the senior level, because not every single person training is going to win a world championship, going to win an Olympic championship, but some of these trials and tribulations and adversity and just wrestling and dealing with it are huge. And it's awesome. I know you put a post up not too long about how like it's so awesome. Or maybe it was in your post speech uh, after the open, like talking about how cool it is to just be able to focus on wrestling. You're getting paid to train and compete in a sport you love. And you're not just doing it in a garage, which there's a lot of wrestlers who do it for love of the sport and they would. But, you know, it was cool watching the open and seeing Burroughs and Slay, two Olympic champs in your corner. Yeah. And you don't see that too often. Maybe Varner and Kale, like can't think of too many Olympic champ duos in a corner. What does that do for you? Like mid match, you know, whether it's halfway through uh, on a step out and you're going back to the middle and you're looking over and you're seeing those two. And I know for me, like dealing with Burroughs, for example, and Slay, like we've built websites for them. We've done stuff for them and them having confidence is is a fun thing like them being grateful for you what has that been like to look over and see their confidence to see their um just see them being there for you yeah i mean they're they're coaching me in a way i want it was just so cool to have jv in the corner like that he he he's i've been telling him he's incredible in the corner like yeah it's a it's a very like confident and also not like super in your face he's not agitated like it doesn't he's just very calm but like to the point and uh i remember in the headlight match towards the end he ran me out of bounds with an underhook towards the end and and jv was i don't know he wasn't even in the corner he was like off to the side it's all (laughs) burger stay in the center like an angry like (laughs) better than that and i just (laughs) remember hearing that and like dude, I'm not going to let this guy down. <laughs> I get to stay in the middle. And, uh, but yeah, I, I thought about that too. After the finals, I'm like, I look over and I have two Olympic gold medalists in my corner and they, they not, they're not only coaching me, but I can tell when they're looking at me, when they're telling me things, they, they believe that I can do it. And so that just like gives me an extra sense of confidence of like, you know, in moments of doubt where maybe I'm like letting things slip in a match. But like, when I look over to them, they're like, Hey, calm down. You can do it. And uh, that's just been super cool to have. Um, and Slay, Slay's been like that every day in practice too. Like that's not just something that happens in in a tournament. It's every time he sees us off in the in the wrestling room, pulls it off to the side, talking to us, giving us our confidence, encouraging us. And so, uh, yeah, you see those things pour over into a tournament. And backwards hat burrows might be one of my favorites because we don't <laughs> see that too often. <laughs> we, really, we don't get backwards hat burrows too often. That that was a fun one. He is. He's just so personable. You know, I know from working with him on the marketing digital side, I don't get that level of like 
in wrestling, it's so the level of adrenaline produces that like tone you heard him scream. <laughs> like you, you can hear it. And he's not just like just coaching you. Obviously, he's a couple weight classes up, but you have him in the room. You, you know, you have him, McFadden, Mark Hall above you, Joey McKenna lighter than you. The plethora of training athletes around your weight at the PRTC has to be an incredible thing where you have guys at that level. You know, you have Joey McKenna with so much success and um, experience now. You have Burroughs, the greatest of all time. You have Mark Hall, McFadden, who are looking to get there. Like, what is it like being able to train with all those guys? Yeah, I mean, you hit it on the head where having a not just not just partners in the room, um, but elite guys where all our entire RTC is either already on the national team or wrestling to be on the national team at final X. Like yeah. not many other places can say that they've been able to do that. And uh, yeah. So I just, I, I've, I had the, I have the experience of Joey where Joey is one of the best wrestlers in as far as like tech technicality and like his ability to move is unbelievable unmatched by it there's only a few other guys that i've ever felt where i'm like that guy's an incredible wrestler right you know joey's one of those guys and then we have like dave and jb mark I, i've only been able to wrestle with them a few times but they they all bring different aspects of things uh all have different styles and then also there is this the culture is one of our values is serve others and that's huge it, i've seen it where whether they lose having a tough time at home, whatever it is. It's just, we're always looking to get each other's back, encourage each other. And and that's just as important as the wrestling side of things. Like we're yeah. meeting outside of the room, not because we have to, because we want to, we're doing Bible studies together. We're, you know, catching up on the weekend, whatever it is. And uh, yeah, I remember even Dave after he, after he lost at the U S open, he was just so happy for me and Joey to be in the finals and encouraging us and excited to be like, I can't wait to watch you guys wrestle tomorrow. And like whatever we needed, he was there. And it was just like, wow, this is so much bigger than just winning wrestling matches. And I really do feel at home here. And I, I, I should, now that he's a PRTC guy, dude, Doug Zapp, who Zapp, who has a work ethic of a workhorse. Yeah. Um, Kevin is always sharing their battles between getting there earlier and putting work in. And I, you know, just being around other people, Sometimes it's not even about their success. It's just about their work ethic. I have friends who, who who haven't had the best of luck, and I've had friends on the opposite end of the spectrum. And the thing for me that's more contagious is, is the work ethic and what they bring to the table every day. And you've got guys putting in the work on every level from, you know, what even what Kevin does as director of operations, like his passion. I don't know if there's another Twitter account or person that is that vocal and adamant you know, he's back in 2018 tweeting about 2025 or 2024 NCAAs in Philly and what he'll do different. And, you know, to have that kind of energy excitement for you to only focusing on wrestling. There's a lot of people who either want to wrestle and coach or maybe wrestle and run a business, whatever it might be for you. What was the decision to really just I want to focus on wrestling and getting better and nothing else right now? Yeah. So right out of college, had the opportunity to jump on staff at Nebraska and I was there for two years. One of them was the crazy COVID year. So, um, but it was just when I, when I would, I loved coaching and I had a great time doing it, but it was when the competition started ramping back up after everything was opening up and I was losing and like, I'm, <laughs> I, I just, I kind of lose my mind a little bit. Like I'm, I'm not, yeah. I don't, I don't like losing at all. And so when I do lose, I kind of go back to the drawing board and be like, Hey, we're going to figure this out. Cause I don't want to be losing wrestling matches. Right. And I just, I was splitting time too much where I, I really enjoyed when I'm in the room and I'm helping these guys and I'm seeing them have success. And maybe even something that I thought that I had a piece of and seeing them do it out there and it translated out on the mat. And that that was really cool, really rewarding. But then when it came down to when I need to get workouts in or a lot of my time was spent doing individuals or whatever, when I thought that I needed to be getting more work 
And then I'm losing wrestling matches and I'm like, oh my gosh, dude, I, I can't, I can't continue <laughs> pour into other people's careers when I still have one going. So I decided to step out of coaching and just pursue uh, my own athletic career. And it's been amazing. And yeah, I, I mean, you've hinted at it. I'm, I'm living my dream. I like, I live in a beautiful building. I go and train. I have a team that supports us and is there for us. And it feels closer like a family than anything else. And, you know, we're in a cool period of time where wrestlers can actually get paid and have a comfortable living. And it's like, dude, this is, this is what I dreamed about when I was a kid. Right. I'm only wrestling. I show, I work out in the morning. I get to go up to the pool and sit out in the sun for several hours. And like, that's my recovery. And then I, you know, if I need something else, but like, this is, this is amazing. I, I, you couldn't get this as a wrestler even five, 10 years ago. And you guys are on the same building, aren't you? Same floor as JB. JB's just down the hall. <laughs> so yeah. you guys like have that, like the fellowship really extends past the room because, yeah. you know, I remember when Lauren and Jordan were telling me about the loft and, and all this. And I remember like slowly piecing it together after like seeing on Instagram, like all you guys at the same pool and like windows similar. <laughs> like it started piecing. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool that you guys all get to kind of have that fellowship. And I mean, Great for Jordan. He's had all these babysitters for his kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beacon and Laurel run down here randomly, open our door, and we get to hang out with them. So it's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. So, one of the things that I love about the US Open now being a final X qualifier is wrestling finals are some of the best matches you'll ever see. And with final X being separate, we get five weeks. I think it is to talk about the finals, to talk about each matchup or I guess for men's freestyle, seven of the 10 this weekend, we'll, we'll know the other three um, finals that are missing right now from the bout sheet. But for you, you had five weeks now to prepare for one guy and you can prepare for a guy like Pentelio for the open, but you're still also paying attention to the field. Your your main focus might be Pantelio, but you're you're also focusing on okay. But I also got Sammy and Hydley and this and that. But now for you, there's no questions about it. You have you have two matches, maybe three, with Zane at Final X. And for those listening who don't remember, you guys did wrestle, I believe, 2021 World Team Trials. He teched you. He took third. You took fourth. And since then, you guys have both grown immensely. You're just coming off a U.S. Open thrill over performance. He just got a world medal. So this is not the same Zane, and this is not the same Tyler as when you guys wrestled two years ago. What is your perspective heading into Final X against Zane? I'm just excited to get back that match from Lincoln. I just, I mean, yeah, it, that was a... Uh... For, I mean that so that that was for third and fourth, second day, um, first match of the day. Walked out there, my head's already spinning. Like this isn't for anything, um, and that dude showed up and rolled me up. And like, there's no denying that. And I was just like, whatever. Like this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> <We get stuff. laughs> um, but yeah, and and like people can look back on that match, and I don't think a lot of people are going to be saying that I'm going to win this final X, but to me, you, you hit it. I, I think I've grown tremendously and yep. uh, I've, I've grown into the way I've changed some, some uh, things outside of wrestling where I'm way more dialed in and yeah, I want to, I, I want to get my hands back on him. And I, he, he's an interesting, he's an interesting match because the guy can wrestle really hard. So there's that intimidation factor of like, he's going to be coming and uh, he's not just press forward with no shots. The guy can shoot. He's got good defense. Like this is a perfect storm. And uh, I, I, in my opinion, I think if that match plays out in the world finals, I think Zane wins that match. And so in my mind, I'm going after the best guy in the world right now in the way. Yeah. And so I don't have anything to lose. And I think it's just a really cool opportunity where I don't even have just one match. It, he's going to have to beat me twice if he wants to make the world team. Yep. So there's for sure going to be more than one match. And yeah, man, I'm confident. I, 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 it's like Zane is like a crazy ex-girlfriend. I think about him every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm studying this guy. I'm watching him and uh, preparing for him, but 
also just kind of trying to take in this time of like, this is a cool, this is going to be a cool event. It's right in our backyard in Newark. And uh, I'm excited, man. I think it's going to be, it's going to be good. It's like that meme where the girl and the guy are laying in bed and the girl's facing one way. And she's like, I bet he's thinking about another, another girl. And then he's thinking, it shows you like what he, like his lawnmower engine or something. It's like, it's a, it's like a, a match of Zane or something, but yeah. And it's cool because, you know, final Lex is it's the blessing and a curse. We have such a good team that doing a preview show is hard. Because when you have seven, eight world medalists, it's hard to not pick the incumbent without just having a bias. If you if you have a returning world medalist and you're saying, ah, but, you know, I think they're going to lose to this guy. Fans kind of look at you like, OK, what's your bias? Because, yeah. you know, like you're so it's it's never really fun doing a show, but it it's fun to, you know, talk about with people like somebody's likely going to go down. Who is it going to be? That's going to overtake them. And for you, it, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, it seems like you have that chip on your shoulder. Like I have nothing to lose. I want this match back from Lincoln. I want him. The other interesting aspect for me is that you and Zane both have to be so locked in right now. But you also, in the back of your head, have to start thinking of next year. Because here you guys are wrestling better than you ever have, and now you got to change weights next year. Yeah. So there, there's almost that focus where I have to focus on right now because there's so much noise and decisions and distractions. For you, knowing all that in the back of your mind, is it just like... um? If you win, that almost so if you win, you go to the world championships. If you lose, you start preparing for 2024. Have you given any thought to that process as far as like 2024 is obviously linger lingering? And if there's a casual fan listening, normally in non-Olympic years, there's 10 weight classes at the world championships. At the Olympics, there's only six. Tyler and Zayner at 70. Olympics next year is 65 and 74. Have you started to give that any kind of thought? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's it's impossible to not not be thinking about yeah. the Olympic year. Um, but but then again, it, it almost adds that much more incentive to make this team at 70 where I want to make this team and win a world championship. That's that's a goal of being a world champ in and of itself. Yeah. But also, I make the team and I go medal at the world championships. And I'm sitting out in the semis already yeah. at 74 kilos. So that's a huge advantage where I don't have to go all through all these guys that I've been at the weight that are cutting down hard, that are huge, where it's going to kind of give me a break from, you know, going through guys that are good and, you know, flip a coin of who wins on what day. And uh, yeah, so I, I just think it's just that much more of an incentive of make the world team go medal. And uh, then I get to have a big break as when it comes down to the, the Olympic trials at 74. And it kind of give me some more time to adjust to the weight and where I don't have this stress of like, I got to go through the trial process, all that crazy stuff that happens. And uh, I can just kind of relax and, and fill in. It, you're, I, I'm assuming you can't, you couldn't make 65 if you wanted to, right? At this point. No, I mean, you don't look like you have an ounce of body fat on you. So I, I, I couldn't uh, anticipate going down is, is likely at all. But does anything change your mind? Like, are you just dead set on 74? Yeah, I, I have to. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm about as I, obviously 70 is like my perfect weight. Like yeah. it's, I'm the leanest. I'm the fastest that I, that I can possibly be. It pushes me mentally where I got to put everything into my diet to make sure that I'm dialed in come match day. And then, I just couldn't get down. Maybe if it was day before, I'd think about it. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's always that's every wrestler, right? We just yeah. think about you think that if you cut more weight, you're going to be better. But I don't think that's an advantage for my style and and what I do. The first thing that's going to go is speed and and quickness, and so that's just not going to help me. 
And and it's funny because at 70, I'd say that you, Zane Pentelio, are all perfect 70 kilo guys. Perfect. Yeah. Like 70 70 kilos is all three of you guys where you perform best. So maybe if can we just compromise and get like eight weights? That's what I'm saying. That's what and I'm let's saying. Let's just compromise <laughs> and get eight. I I think 70 is arguably the weight that suffers the most. Maybe 79, maybe. But it's just 70 kilos, man. That's tough. Um, all right. Only a couple more things. I'm going to let you go. A lot of wrestlers have kinesiology degrees, study of body movement. It basically means I just want to be an athlete. Dude, I was going to say, you're using big words right now. You got to you gotta dumb it down for me. So listen, the only reason I know that word, kinesiology, is because you go watch a, a wrestling duel me. Go watch Nebraska Penn State. And you're going to have all of these guys, which says their degree, kinesiology, kinesiology. Eventually you Google it and you say, what the hell does this mean? Study of body movement. You went to school for psychology, which I love. If I, I've told my wife, like if I hit the lottery, I didn't need money and I can go back to like, go to school. I never went to school, go to school and get a degree in something. I love psychology. I don't know if you know who Dr. Jordan Peterson is. I'm fascinated by his stuff. I, I love his perspective. When you went to get a degree in psychology, was that to help you in athletics and wrestling, or do you just naturally like psychology and want to do something with that one day? So, I mean, I have an interesting kind of track through college. Uh, so I went to, I started as nutrition exercise and yeah. I had this chemistry beginning chemistry class that, so first of all, I wasn't the best student in college. I, I mean, I was, pretty much a meatball of not going to class, not doing a lot. <laughs> this class though, I went to every class. I had a tutor on the off days that I'm not going to class. I did all the homework that I could. And I, <laughs> I had an F so bad where even if I aced the final, I couldn't show up. I I, I wouldn't be able to pass the class. I had to go to school and be like, dude, we're taking an F on this. Like there's no shot. And uh, so I changed my degree, went to this business, I think uh, teaching, did not do well in that either. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so uh, I landed on psychology and it was like, it was the first time I went to these classes. I'm like, man, one of the classes, I mean, to be honest, not that hard, but also like really interesting where I'm yeah. showing I actually enjoy what I'm, what I'm working with. Uh, and then I had a really good relationship with, with Snyder at Nebraska and he has a PhD in sociology. And so he kind of like watching him and he had this desire to read. And so I just kind of being around him found this desire as well, where I wasn't really so much focused on stuff in the classroom, but I would always do stuff on my own where I'm reading my own stuff. And yep. psychology just happened to be what I was really interested outside of the classroom as well. And yeah, I just, I've really enjoyed the the mental side of things and but yeah, all the stuff that you've seen of me in college with the tweets and the, 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 you know, all the crazy stuff is like, it's all like the mind stuff. And yeah. uh I've continued that outside of, of the sport. Uh, I do have this huge desire to, to learn and I read very often. And uh, yeah, I think, I think it helps me kind of gain some perspective when I'm actually going out there on the mat. I love it. And one of the last things I'll, I'll bring up, you, you haven't updated your Twitter bio and it has the same thing, all gas, your Instagram, you, you reference it all the time. What does it mean to you? Explain for people who maybe they're newer to Tyler Berger and they see this constantly. Hashtag all gas emoji. You've had it for a while now. Yeah, I I look at that. It's like uh, it's just this motto of it. This isn't just a wrestling thing. Like I'm not just trying to do these things for an end goal. Once I retire, that my life is just going to be you know, breezing by it's, it's just this lifestyle of I'm constantly getting better. I'm always yep. putting the foot on the gas and I'm going to make myself suffer in every way that I know how, so I can get this growth out of me. And I have this tangible thing right now with my career where I can see the results, yep. but that, that doesn't end when I'm done wrestling. Like I'm always pushing myself mentally with this reading. I have goals for reading, memorizing, um, you know, obviously physically, I just, I, I enjoy the, putting myself through 
tough things physically. I think I get the most out of it that way. And um, yeah, it's just a lifestyle. So when I say all gas, it just, uh, it fires me up, man. Because especially when I'm being soft too, like there's the days where I don't, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Like, oh, come on. Like, let's go all gas. You got to stay on it, on the horse every single day. And so, yeah, I try to live by that. And then what, but then what do you do? Do you like take pre-workout? Like when you remind yourself, like, no, 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 we got to go. It's all gas. No, no, what's the thing you turn around and do? No, I just, I got to, I like, no, no pre-workout, no caffeine, none of that stuff. I, I just, it's more like anything as small as like a look in the mirror. And if I like pass the mirror and I'm like, dude, you are so, so, <laughs> you know, like any of that, any kind of seeing that of like, I lay in the bed too long and I'm like scrolling on Instagram too much. And I'm like, get out of bed. Like we are not made no. to lay in this freaking bed, get out and get to work. And uh, so, yeah, I just kind of like threw like, dog and myself in my mind really and then when did like, that start i mean i've seen you use it in social media forever it seems like oh man when did i start using all gas yeah i i start i will i'd said all gas no breaks for the longest time and then and then uh, you wanted a little rest and you're like all right maybe some breaks yeah well then <laughs> and actually at nebraska the gymnastic team their motto was all gas no breaks and i was like bro I've been using this for like a year and they like <laughs> took it as their bot. And I was like, I can't use that anymore. So then I just shorted it down to all gas and I was like, Oh, that's way cooler. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that. Oh man, that's good stuff. All right, Tyler, any final words before I let you go here? Yeah. I mean, I would just like to touch again on uh, kind of that, the whole training camp leading up to us open. I think that a lot of people, especially as athletes think that once you make it, you, you, you will some, whatever victory, a national title, state title, you know, you make the world team world champ that you're going to finally be satisfied. You'll make it in a way and uh, all your worries and troubles and money problem, whatever. Right. It all goes away. And, uh, you know, I just, it's such a lie. And I have the beauty of being around Jordan who has the most world championships ever won in the United States. And that guy will tell you that that's not what gives him the most joy in his life. And yeah. that's not where his identity lies. And so having this win at the U S open was cool. Yes. All of that stuff faded away in a few days. And I guarantee you, nobody's going to remember it the way that I remember it. They're not going to yeah. be asking about it for much longer. And, uh, to me, my, I think that that's where I rely back on my faith. Of I'm not here to win wrestling matches. Yeah. Will it be good? Does it, does it feel good to have work pay off? Yes. But, uh, I'm here to know God and make him known. And I think that that when I'm resting in that, that's when I feel the most joy. And when I am actually beating on my craft, I, I feel like I'm expressing myself in a way that's worshiping him. And so, yeah, I think that that's my message from, from leaving the U S open. Cause uh, that's not the, the victory fades and people forget and no one really cares anymore. And I think you got to lean on something bigger in order to get through, you know, to the next thing. You have to because God sees the whole picture. You know, I'll I'll go off on a tangent on this podcast randomly and, and I'll see comments like, oh, stop talking about this or or stop preaching or let the let your guests talk, whatever. It's like, listen, if I have a conviction to say something, this is my podcast. I'm going to say it because God can use it or it wouldn't be on my heart to say. Absolutely. So it's, it's definitely crucial when you see the whole picture or when God sees the whole picture. And like you said, it's funny because sometimes I see these things on Twitter where it's like, show your your most um iconic celebration that you remember and i know like hundreds and i'm like struggling I'm like uh uh what about like you forget about these things so quick you yeah. know and it's like i have a couple that i've used on websites and stuff with like bo nichols titanic jumping to kale's arms like there's ones or like burrows that i use a lot so i see them but you forget about so many of these things because the moments are truly fleeting I mean, we just had a baby after having one 15 months ago and we brought her home and she's like seven pounds and my son who's 15 months old who t before we had mila seemed like such a little baby and then yeah. mila comes home and we're like where did the last 15 months go he's like ready for high school so yeah. it's it's crazy how how fle fleeing time is man yeah it is and i'm, I'm sure like you can just you gain so much more perspective going back to your family, like whether you're successful, whether you, you know, your podcast is killing it or whatnot, like your baby still needs you. 
and right. you're still going to be waking up in the middle of the night from them crying and need something. It's like those moments I think are way more special and way like you just, you see how God is like stripping away pride in those moments of like, yeah. listen, it's not about getting all the money, you know? And when you, when you follow your convictions and you follow your heart, cause God puts something on your heart, that's where the fulfillment is. So even if you feel convicted, not to over spiritualize it, if you felt convicted to go wrestle in Egypt and you're like, man, this sucks. But God's like, don't worry, I'm doing this for a bigger reason. Maybe it's a conversation you had at an airport with someone yeah. that you don't even know. Maybe you're thinking about it being the setup for the open. Meanwhile, you run into somebody who you said something to. So it's crazy, man. A lot, lot to be said about following conviction and, and keeping eyes off worldly prizes. Not that they're bad things, but as Slay loves to say, the greater gold. So, yeah. all right, guys, go follow Tyler on social. He's T-Berg. T B E R G 41 on Instagram. We're getting, get him back on Twitter. Husker underscore Husker underscore one fifty seven on Twitter. Um, tweet at him all gas. So he gets, gets back on Twitter. All right, man. I will, uh, I'll be in, in Newark for final X. So I, I will see you there, man. Have all a right, good man. one. See you soon, brother. Appreciate you. Awesome. See ya. And the beat goes on.